today's modern world, is there such a thing as normal family life? Who's to say what's normal? Some families enjoy a dangerous life. Some crave a relaxing life. And some just like the wildlife. In this series, we'll be visiting households across the globe to celebrate the wonderful, the inspirational, and the eccentric. Welcome to the world's most extraordinary families. Coming up, we go monkey mad with the Genota family. It's like raising a two-year-old child on steroids. And we meet the Gifford family, who left it all behind to sail around the world. Our family went from the American dream lifestyle to living below the federal poverty line. But first, we're off to Canada to meet a family of bodybuilders who flex their huge muscles on stage together. Annets, a muscular family of bodybuilders who live and train together in Sarnia, Canada. They are one of the only families to compete on the world stage and have won hundreds of competitions between them. I think my family is unique in more ways than one. There's not many families that actively compete the way we do. The moment I walk on stage, I'm, in, I'm at home. I love it. You see families that are into fitness, but we've taken it almost to the next level. Like my mom's a, a pro now, and like my sisters, they both look, you know, amazing on stage. You feel very proud of them, and my dad's 50 now, and he looks just amazing. Today, the family are taking a trip to their second home, the gym. And along for the ride is newest member of the family, grandson Hunter. I love coming to the gym with their kids. Yeah. We're gonna have a good time today. This is a hot spot. We come here and get down. This, we don't play here. We spend usually maybe four to five hours a day when I'm prepping. But on a regular day or off season, maybe a couple of hours a day I'll spend at the gym. We'll For do body. some upper body movements, uh, be chest, maybe arms, a little bit of shoulders. We'll work on, we'll try and tee on one or two different muscles today. This is a belt concert. <laughs> Are you ready to work yeah, out? Yeah, that's too. It's the Hall of Fame for the fitness athletes, uh, different sports. Um, that's my picture. I was probably about 35 there. And of course, we've got the family picture here as well. Alongside his day job as a fraud investigator, 50-year-old dad Dean has been competing in bodybuilding shows for the last 18 years. Always grew up looking at uh, like bodybuilding magazines when I was a kid. And uh, I said, you know what, one day maybe I can do that. And then once our kids got to a certain age, uh, they were more independent. That's when, when I got involved. I was probably 32 years old when I started, so I started late. My category is a lightweight division. I'm not a real big guy, but when I get on stage, I look big and I'm very conditioned. And that's where I really win and I be, beat the big guys. Even at my age, I, meet, I beat the young guys still. Once you stand on that stage, and people are looking at you, you become a different person. You wouldn't be like that in your real life. But that is the bug. There to witness Dean catch the bodybuilding bug was wife-to-be Bridget. Just seeing him on stage like that, I was like, oh wow, he's like Superman, I was his little fan. <laughs> I was oohing and on around, and I was like, I wanna do it next. As well as being a safety technician and emergency first responder at a gas refinery, 47-year-old mum Bridget began a gruelling routine in preparation to compete on the world stage. I'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, go to the gym, I'll do an hour of cardio, I'll do my hour of morning workout, I'll go to work, work 12 hours, I'll come home, I'll go back to the gym, I'll do an hour workout and then I'll do another hour cardio. So I was getting like three, four hours of sleep. And for the couple's four children, growing up with bodybuilding parents was a unique experience. You know, you stand up in class and they'd be like, tell us something cool about yourself. And I'd be like, so my parents are bodybuilders. What do your parents do? <laughs> Growing up with bodybuilders as parents was intimidating for my friends. Like boys did not come over. It was definitely different. Like, I remember all my friends coming over and they're like, oh my God, your parents are so jacked. Like, like how do they do it? I feel really blessed to have my family 
And I think to have a family that's all into bodybuilding is unique and awesome. I have one son that does not like bodybuilding. He has a second degree black belt. He's an amazing man. Growing up with a bodybuilder family, <laughs> uh, it's fun in its own way, though. When I was little, my dad would just work out while my mom was taking care of him. He's tried it. He's just, he's just not into it. He's his own man. It wasn't long before 29-year-old Barsha and 25-year-old son Tyler followed in their parents' footsteps. That was a good set. Yeah. At the age of 18, Barsha competed in her first bodybuilding show. Ended up placing fifth. I was absolutely mortified, like crushed, because in your head when you go into a show, like watching my parents compete, they always get number one. My sister did her first show and I saw her do it and I was like, wow, like this is amazing. Like this is totally for me. And cheerleading coach, 27-year-old daughter Dina, was the last family member to join the team. I loved how their bodies were changing and like the dedication they had. So that's how I kind of got into it. And they're like, we need a bikini girl. So I was like, well, okay. Training as a family can get competitive, especially as mum Bridget and daughter Barsha compete against one another in the women's physique category. We are very competitive. My daughter and I do not play. We go hard in the gym and we go hard on stage. When I'm on the stage, I'm not her mother. She comes at me like a stranger and I come at her the same way. I love my mom, please don't get me wrong, but I like to win. Training with her is great, it's great motivation. I love doing it, but when I know I can do something a little bit better than her, I mean, I feel great. <laughs> We're very competitive and the boys, I believe they're the same way. They won't admit it, but they really are. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> Who's the strongest family member? We all have our strengths. I'm probably strongest. Hmm, who's the strongest in the family? <laughs> I would have to say probably me. Coming up, find out what it takes to feed this family of bodybuilders and how they struggle to fight off temptation. I am starving. <laughs> so going into this grocery store is gonna be a struggle. <laughs> But now, we meet Mum and Dad, Pinky and Roly Genota, and their five monkey children. In the rural town of Beecher, Illinois, animal mad Pinky and Roly Genota live on their farm, Settler's Pond. Well, I chat more to the animals than to humans. <laughs> and are parents to five primate monkeys. It's like raising a two-year-old child on steroids. It's a constant thing. They demand your attention. You can't just leave them in a cage. And they want to bottle. They want to be held and cuddled and loved. And it's a very demanding job. The monkeys joined the family after they were mistreated and abandoned by their previous owners. The names of my monkeys are Maybelline, oh. Max Factor, L'Oreal, Avon and Mary Kay. Maybelline is the matriarch. She's the head of them. Mary Kay is the baby. She's a year old. L'Oreal is my thumb sucker. You guys are funny. Come here. Come here. Avon is a bonnet monkey. Max was the sickest one that came in. He's three years old. Max is laid back. He's a sweetheart. Hi, buddy. How you doing? He just is. Uh, probably one of our calmer primates. And just like human babies, the monkeys can make quite a mess. When they were little, they weren't too bad, but when they get bait, like they'll jump over you or run around you, or you try to get them and they're gone. They're fast. They're a lot of fun though. Pretty cool, huh, Max? I um, make them breakfast, they get a bath, and then they play, and then we get cuddle time. You know, my husband will rock them as well. And then they do go to sleep, and they'll sleep all night through. They're, they're very good. But now the monkeys have been forced to move out of the family home after Pinky developed cancer. I am spending less time with them now because um, I am ill, and I spend 18 hours on a machine that infuses um, nutrients and vitamins and minerals that my body's lacking. 
I miss them terribly. They miss me too. I can't bring them in as often as I would like to. So it's very, it's very hard to um, spend this kind of time with them. It's like having a bond that you have with your own children. It's a beautiful feeling to see them get excited when they see you walk in the room and unconditional love. And no matter what happens, they're there to love you and you to love them. But the family haven't always had a home full of exotic animals. I used to own a restaurant and um, I did catering. And my husband, he used to raise beef and dairy. It just wasn't very fulfilling. It wasn't what we wanted. You're awake, oh my goodness. The couple sold their restaurant and dairy farm to start a new life at Settler's Pond, an animal sanctuary for abandoned and neglected creatures. Their family was about to get much bigger. Settler's Pond went from just a couple animals and a few dogs to about 300 animals on a 60-acre facility. Mm. You ready for your breakfast? Through the years, they just keep coming in. We try not to turn anything away. Some people think we're nuts, but it's been kind of rewarding. It's kind of neat, because you get an animal that you don't see any way it's going to live, but it makes it. Settler's Pond has become a charity rescue shelter with around 10 volunteers helping to care for the animals. We got a horse that came in that had foundered and we called the vet and we have chose to give him a chance at life instead of uh, euthanizing him. So we're going to clean his hoof and repack it and give him his meds. Come here, General. Now the family might be hairy, but they're also hungry and feeding them doesn't come cheap. It's very expensive. The specialty feeds that you need, the medical needs. My husband used to work 50, 60, 70 hours extra a week overtime. Then we reach out to the public, which, you know, the public only does what they can do, too. There are times that uh, an animal needs a surgery and the mortgage needs to be paid. Uh, sometimes the mortgage goes on the back burner for a little bit. And we just uh, beg, borrow, and steal, I guess. <laughs> This is Bubba, the camel. He's a couple years old. He came in from Oklahoma. He's just like a dog. When I ride my moped up and back and forth to the barn, he chases up and down like a dog would chase you down the driveway. Bubba! Bubba! Bubba the camel was rescued from a zoo in Missouri after it was forced to close down. He was orphaned, and uh, we went down and picked him up in the ambulance. Next, the Genota family is about to get even larger. They must be quackers. That happens almost every day here. Now, we are setting sail with the Giffords to experience family life on the ocean. Our family has literally sailed around the world in a circumnavigation. Meet the Gifford family. In 2008, Mum Bean, Dad Jamie and their three children embarked on a dream voyage around the globe and have been living on water ever since. Welcome aboard. This is exciting for me to get to share what it's like to live on a boat that's a home. When we started, our kids were four, six and nine years old. And at that time, none of them were swimmers, which made us probably the worst parents in the world, taking our kids to live on a boat when they couldn't swim. Choosing to live adventurously on a boat and explore the world with my family is the best decision I ever made. Ten years on, the family have visited 48 countries, traveling over 58,000 miles. We've been to Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, Lesotho, Grenada, Mexico, all over. I mean, too many to count, really. Our family has literally sailed around the world in a circumnavigation, and that took us uh, actually eight years from the time that we went out. And when I think about how many places that actually is, it's, it's overwhelming. A lot of what we do are just things that 
we would never have been able to do if we stayed on land. The Giffords are part of a growing but little known community of people called cruisers, couples and families who spend months, even years, at sea, living on a boat. It's exciting because we're going to head out and do something new and it's relaxing because moving on the water is just, it's peaceful, it's wonderful. But before the family cast off, their lives were very different back on land. As well as being a sailor, Dad Jamie owned a business distributing medical equipment and Mum Bean worked in digital marketing. Our life before we went cruising was one of, of comfort, of uh, financial security. We had a large house in a, in a high demand area in one of the best school districts in our home state. Despite their comforts on land, the family had a longing for a life on the ocean. I had grown up with this idea that I wanted to live on a boat someday and go sailing around the world and we thought it would be when we were retired or later on in life, but we had a really challenging year. We had the birth of our second child and two weeks later, my mother-in-law passed away. It was very unexpected. It made us reevaluate or look at what we, what, what's important in life. And we weren't spending time with, our, with each other, with our children as much as we wanted. So we, we sat down and we came up with this idea and we made a plan. <laughs> After planning for the next six years and saving almost 90,000 US dollars, Mum and Dad quit their jobs, rented out the family home in Seattle, Washington, took the children out of school and loaded their lives onto a 47-foot sailboat they christened Totem. Our parents had told us for a long time that we could be doing this big trip, and when it finally happened, we were all really excited. When we took off as a family, we left San Francisco and sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge. It was really like we were starting again for the first time and doing it together, and it was exhilarating. And I'll never forget it, um, that moment that we were starting this grand adventure as a family. For the next 10 years, the family lived and traveled the globe together and had to adjust to living in close quarters. When we moved aboard, we were downsizing from a five-bedroom house. And I don't even remember how many bathrooms it had. It had a bunch. <laughs> and living on the boat, it's highly compact. We're fitting so much living into that space. We're fitting in both uh, all three of the bedrooms and two bathrooms, uh, a living space and a kitchen, which we call the galley, and our navigation station. All of this life into not even half of the size of our garage in the house that, that we gave up when we went cruising. Day-to-day -day life, it's different every day. If we show up into a new place, it can be figuring out provisions and groceries or fuel if we need fuel. It can be more of a field trip thing where we're in a cool place and we want to go out and see historical exhibits or, or museums or, or safaris so we're going out looking for animals. After 10 years living on a boat, the family have returned home. They have been docked for the last two months and are having to get used to being back on dry land. Their home, the good ship Totem, needs some maintenance. This summer, we're taking time away from the boat to come back to the Pacific Northwest because it had to come out uh, for a bit of work. So it's in a shipyard getting some necessary work done. We've now been back for a couple of months and it's changed a lot. The US is a very different place. We, we feel in many ways like we're visitors in our home country. The family's three children have spent the majority of their lives living at sea, so returning to land has been quite an adjustment. The places we've been able to go, and the people we've been able to meet, and the things we've been able to see, the animals, the cultures, especially coming back to the US and um, getting into land life, going through the motions, and not having any of that anymore, I really started to feel it like, wow, I had it good. Coming up, the family meet a new pair of cruisers and warn them of the potential dangers of the high seas. We were in Australia before we left and every Aussie we spoke to was basically like, you're gonna die. <laughs> but now back in Canada with the Annett family, who are trying their best not to cheat on their diets. I am probably the worst one. I'm the closet eater of the family. <laughs> I've heard of coming out the closet, but not for ice cream, come on. After an intense workout, Dad Dean and daughter Barsha are heading to the supermarket to buy supplies for the household. Chicken? Chicken, probably steak, spinach. 
it's not for everybody. And to be successful, you have to love it. But shopping for this bodybuilding family can be expensive. It costs about $300. A week. A week, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's expensive. There's no extras in there, no sweets, no sugars, nothing like that. It's only what's on the diet, and that goes back to the house. I am starving. <laughs> so going into this grocery store is going to be a struggle. <laughs> Survival is at its peak today, let me tell you. <laughs> to be a bodybuilder, you must follow a strict diet. And in the lead up to a show, the family follow a process called prepping, a four month period of intense workout and dieting. Once you switch from the off season diet, to the on-season diet to get ready for stage. It's five square meals a day, and you eat all meats in those, those meals. You have to decrease the carbs uh, in order to lose some body weight and body fat. We got uh, broccoli, got some green beans. You can see we got skinless, boneless chicken breasts. Temptation is huge, especially when you're dieting. The Lucky Charms caught my eye. The chips. Chips. The, the chips. chips for me, I love chips. My husband, I have caught him outside, hiding by the freezer on his hands and knees, and it's like, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? He's crossed down. What? Nothing. And he turns around, and there's brown stuff around his mouth. Well, what is that around your mouth, dear? I don't know. Well, that's not right. Chocolate ice cream. Okay, I couldn't help myself. This is like Mission Impossible. You go in with a goal, you go in, you get out, you, you slap hands because you did it successfully and you keep it moving. I am probably the worst one. I'm the closet eater of the family. <laughs> I've heard of coming out the closet, but not for ice cream. Come on. We're human, so sometimes we do cheat on our diet. Not so much me, because I'm perfect, right? When you catch someone cheating, um, like on their diet, if they're getting ready for a show, it's it's a lot of guilt trip. It's a, uh, oh, so is your competitor doing that? I hope second tastes good. <laughs> Things like that. So, you know, you don't want to mess up because you don't want to hear that. <laughs> All right, big mo. All right, good job, Dad. I'm not old, I'm not that old. <laughs> we all hold each other accountable, trust me. My son, Tyler, he is the worst one. If he sees somebody eating something they shouldn't, <laughs> he'll say, you aren't supposed to be eating that. That's not your diet. And he will hold you accountable. I'm making sure everything's running smooth. <laughs> oh my you God, I miss it. Who wants fish? It's so hard to stick to it, and the last month was horrible. The scraps are bad. Look, <laughs> and they're mine. I have two, don't touch mine. You don't have mine. I have two. Leading up to a contest, bodybuilders must live on controlled portion sizes. The men of the family eat around 2,000 calories and the women around 1,500 calories per day. People think bodybuilders are stupid. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're very intelligent. You have to know how to manipulate your body to do what it does. Anybody that can stand on that stage, they have to have discipline. If the family stay disciplined and stick to their diets all week, they reward themselves with a junk-infused cheat meal. Those are good days. It's a free-for-all, I'm telling you right now. Burgers, fries, chips. I love sugar. Chocolate cake. Burger and fries, and then I have some ice cream. Mac and cheese balls wrapped in bacon and frying it twice. I would eat that double. We'll go to sushi, we'll go to get a burger. And when you finish, you feel sick. Well, you're not supposed to go crazy. But we're crazy people, so. <laughs> oh, they always crazy. Everybody in the house is crazy. <laughs> Coming up, Mum Bridget hits the stage and Dad Dean shows off his tanning skills. This is the best part of it. <laughs> but now, Pinky and Roly Janota show us some of the more exotic members of their family. We got a call. They wanted to rescue two tigers. The Janota's beloved monkey family are now unable to live in the household as Pinky continues her treatment for cancer. You want your cookie? I miss him terribly because each one of these is like my heart and my soul. They might be her favorites, but the monkeys aren't the only creatures to steal Pinky's heart. The couple care for over 300 other rescued animals, and today they welcome another addition to the family. Hi there. Yeah. yeah. 
We came to relinquish our uh, ducks. We couldn't keep them at home anymore, so wanted to make sure there was a safe place for them. We got them for Easter, it was about two, three dollars a piece. Didn't expect them to grow that big, that fast. This family have fallen foul of rules restricting the ownership of poultry as pets, so they're left with no choice but to bring them to Settler's Pond. It happens almost every day here. They get a pet and they can't take care of it anymore, or it grows or it's something that they can't have. They choose to bring it to a non-kill shelter and this is what we do. I like it here. It's, um... I think they're going to be much happier. They have more room to roam with other animals here. It seems like a very friendly place. So, absolutely. I've never seen anything like this before around here. It's different. I feel pretty comfortable with leaving them here. Right. This seems like a nice place. I'll Come send you guys some video, OK? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a safe trip. Ducks and monkeys aren't the only creatures to find their way to Settler's Pond. The family answer distress calls to rescue all types of animals in their very own ambulances. We've probably had about 40, 50 calls. You know, mostly dogs and, and cats and fallow deer and, and a camel. Our area is very large. It's from uh, Minnesota to New York to Florida to Oklahoma and um, we travel that with two ambulances and we get calls from people or businesses or um, organizations that need help. The team travel far and wide and it can sometimes put them in dangerous situations. We got a call, they wanted to rescue two tigers. I guess they might have been somebody's pets and then they started getting too rough to handle. So the crew went out and they didn't know really what to do because it was kind of scary, it was new for everybody. And they actually were able to get them in there pretty good with nobody getting hurt, got them rescued. You get in a situation where you just kind of got to figure out what's the best way where nobody gets hurt, keep it safe. Settler's Pond is one of only five rescue centers in the country licensed to care for domestic livestock and exotic animals. So the family's farm has become a home to creatures great and small. These are my African crested porcupines. Um, they came in from a zoo in Branson, Missouri. So we picked them up in the ambulance and she was pregnant. <laughs> and they don't shoot their quills at you. They stomp their feet, they growl, and if you haven't moved by that time, I don't know what to tell you. In some states in the US, you are not required to hold a license to have an exotic animal as a pet, so you never know what could be in your neighbor's backyard. People go online and they can buy any kind of animal they want, and then after the person that's purchased the animal realizes that they can't care for it or it's not what they expected, then what do you do with it? And then it comes into our facility. I don't care if somebody wants a pet. They want to be noticed. Go paint your hair blue. Coming up, the family have a monkey birthday party and the whole town is invited. It's your birthday, right? But now back on board with the Gifford family. And what would you do if you were in the middle of the ocean and your boat caught on fire? We needed to find the source of the fire. It's somewhere on Totem. To fund their seafaring adventures, Dad Jamie spends some of his time as a sailmaker, and Mum Bean has written a book about cruiser life. However, the family claim they are far from rich and live on just 30,000 US dollars a year. Our life, it is pretty great in a lot of ways, but it, it isn't always like sitting in a hammock swinging, drinking a Mai Tai with an umbrella in it. It's actually really difficult. The hardest parts of it for me are actually the stress of financial uncertainty. It's taken me a really long time to get comfortable with. Our family went from having two really high incomes and sort of the American dream lifestyle in a, uh, in a very upscale part of the country uh, to living below the federal poverty line. And becoming comfortable with that is an ongoing process. <laughs> One of the other ways they make some cash is meeting and coaching other families looking to start their own cruising adventure. 
Today, they are meeting Janae and John. Come on board. Great to see you guys. It's really great to have a chance to sit down with you guys. I think it would really help Jamie and I just to hear you talk about where you are and thinking about going cruising and what your major concerns are. You know, we've, we've looked at Mexico. We're worried a little bit. You know, you hear a lot of reports about, is it safe? Is it safe for cruisers? Um, we have dogs. I'm not sure how that all works. These are all things we can work through. Although their life may look like a vacation, it hasn't all been plain sailing for the Giffords and they have found themselves in some rough waters. I could smell smoke. I could smell burning plastic, that acrid smell. It's probably two o'clock in the morning when this happens too. We needed to find the source of the fire. It's somewhere on totem, and fiberglass boats like this are basically big plastic tubs in the water. You may only have a couple of minutes until you have to be off the boat uh, for your own safety. And Jamie and I are frantically looking all over the boat we finally honed in on it, and it probably only took 30 seconds, but that 30 seconds felt like forever. It was that water coming into the boat because of the really rough seas that we were having. A little had gotten into the charge controller for our solar panel, and it had caused a short. So Niall is up, and he's preparing for the possibility of abandoning ship. Fortunately, the fuse did what the fuse is supposed to do. Power was cut off to the charge controller, and, and there was no further risk of fire. This is actually one of the scariest things that uh, we've experienced in a decade on the boat. Apart from some of the dangers of cruiser life, the couple are also keen to know what it's like living as a married couple on board. So you guys are together a lot. Yes. I mean, you're on the boat all the time. Is, are there times you wish you could, you know, get away? <laughs> is, does it work all the time? How does that work? Our, yes, there are times that we each need to get away. Yeah, our boat is a very small house, but we have a big backyard. <laughs> it's easy to jump in the dinghy and go for a walk on the mm -hmm. beach or oh, go for a yeah, swim or... We're with each other 24-7 and uh, before we went cruising, we had but busy jobs and we might see each other for a few hours a day and that would be it. And it's a, it's a big difference when you're with each other all the time. For a typical teenager, no escape from mum and dad may feel like a big challenge. This is the kids' end, uh, forward of the mast. Our son has a cabin on the port side with two bunk beds, and then the girls share a cabin all the way at the front. And they like to say there's an invisible line down the middle, uh, but really they're basically sharing the equivalent of a big double bed. For the Gifford kids, living on the boat is all they have ever known. The only things I ever really remember are just little fragments of what it was like before we were living on the boat and what it happened after. It's everything I've known since I was little, so it's kind of hard to have a perspective of what it would be like from a land life. I guess if you're living in a house and you think of living on a cramped little boat, it must be no privacy whatsoever, you know? But you get used to it, and uh, it's really not nearly as bad as uh, I think you'd imagine. We don't fight that much. Part of it is because we're in such close quarters that I get along very well with my siblings, usually, most of the time. Growing up at sea means the children are boat schooled, with mum and dad providing all their education whilst on board. Here in the main cabin is really where most living takes place. Around the table, we have our meals. Homework happens here, having shelves on the outboard side where we can keep all of the kids' books, their school books. But overwhelmingly, yeah, this is, this is our living space. I've been homeschooled and I went to a normal school uh, when we were in Australia, so I think I have both perspectives and I enjoy both. I think we have more experiences, for the ones my age at least, but not with others, like with normal school life. I think I'm a little different with that. I need to adjust. And I'm not as good at socializing as my siblings. When I look at the incredible wealth of opportunities that we've had as a family and that we've, when he, we have been able to give our children, it's been worth every compromise that we made along the way. Next, the family share their final meal on board before saying bon voyage to son Niall as he heads off to college. I'll turn my back and I'll be like, yes. No! <laughs> but now it's time for a special birthday party at the farm with the Genota family. Happy birthday to you.
Back at Settlers Pond, today the Genota family are having a community open day at the farm to celebrate their monkeys' birthdays. Can we sing to them? Happy birthday, dear monkeys. Happy birthday, dear May May Max, Maybelline, Ava. Day to you. Here. It warms my heart to see all these people come out here and show their support for us. I mean, when you get blue and down and you start doubting things, this makes it all worthwhile. It really does. Normally they don't get things like this, but it's your birthday, right? And today here to lend a helping hand is monkey grandma and Pinky's mom, Janet. It's wonderful and with all the volunteers and such, you just can't believe so many people want to help with something like this. To keep Settlers Pond running, the family rely on donations from the public, and today the community has been very generous. Well, you've been collecting for a while, haven't you? Dog food, cat food, we use a lot of paper towels, and bleach is our major sanitizer. And then we do, excuse me, my husband does probably 40 loads of dog bedding a week. Pretty much everybody donates anything, we can use everything. And that support is just what the family and the animals need as Pinky continues to battle with her illness. But there are no signs of her slowing down just yet. I think it's tough on her and she, she wasn't as tough as she is. I think it would be a lot harder. How can you slow down? These guys gotta eat every day. That's what amazes me about her. She just, no matter what comes on, she kinda figures it out and makes it work. Even now that she's ill, you know, she keeps going. You can see her walking around with her IV pole, so I couldn't be more proud or pleased with the woman she's grown up to be. It's just beautiful. I really was surprised, and I was shocked at the amount of people that showed up. To tell you the truth, I was really down and depressed. So I wasn't... This was beautiful. It turned out wonderful, honey. You did a good job. <laughs> Don't you start crying. <laughs> yeah, there's Mamie. I couldn't imagine my life without doing all of this. I don't think I'd know how to survive. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Back on board with the Gifford family and they are preparing to say their final goodbyes to eldest son, Niall, as tomorrow he is heading off to Lewis and Clark College in Portland. Tonight, they have decided to have one last family dinner on board together. What we eat just depends on where we are and what we can get and what's fresh. And, you know, today that was, there was some good peppers and an onion and some sausages and there's dinner. In Thailand, we learned to cook lob, and in South Africa, we learned to cook baboti. In the Maldives, it was mashuni. And so these are now part of our family's cooking culture, and, and it's fun to have those. South Africa has a lot of really good meats. Thailand has really good street food. I think we eat exceptionally well. It may not be fancy, but it's healthy, and it's interesting, and it's good. And with the good ship Totem losing its first crew member in over a decade, the family are getting ready to say goodbye to Niall as he begins his new life on dry land. Niall, how's it going to feel when you're at school and we're off in the tropics? I'll turn my back and I'll be like, yes. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. There'll be a feeling of loss in a way, but, um, but I also feel like it's another adventure, it's another journey for him, and I'm super excited for him. I know it's not gonna be easy for him, but he's a strong kid and he's a smart kid. I just hope it's not too difficult to, to find his way. When we put the boat back in the water and we sail away and you're not there, I'm gonna, I need tissues. <laughs> That's gonna be hard. <laughs> We're gonna miss you. Yeah. Come here. I'm glad to be moving on to the next stage of life, you know, college and new things to learn, but I am going to miss the boat. Um, I'm going to miss traveling a lot. And with Niall flying the nest, 
Living on land is not on the horizon for the rest of the family just yet. For our family, it's getting Totem back into, into shape, make her ready to go again, and, and uh, we'll do that in Mexico, which is a terrific cruising area, and then hoping to get back out into the Pacific. There's so many parts of the world that we can't wait to see that we haven't yet. This way of life has changed me profoundly. It's enabled me to find happiness I can't imagine having found otherwise. It's brought me closer to my family. For the Annets, a life competing all over the world has taught the family some valuable lessons, and one bump in the road could be the difference between first place or going home empty-handed, as Mum Bridget found out in a competition in Florida back in July 2018. There was an accident on the highway. We got to the airport a minute late, missed our flight, bought new tickets, came back, Flew out again the next day and I gained 10 pounds in the air. When you fly, you hold water. Water is not good because you can't see any of the muscle when you're holding water. Before a big show, these buff competitors attempt to drain out water from their bodies in the hope of looking as shredded as possible. Sometimes the air pressure causes your body to swell. And with me, it's just one of those things that happens. To get rid of the extra carry-on weight Bridget gained on the flight, she was forced to do rigorous cardio, take saunas whilst reducing her water intake. That night I had to get the water out, so I sucked it all out. So I lost like 12 pounds overnight, and my body just shut down. You look your best, but you feel the worst. She was upset. She said, I don't think I can do the show. I said, we're here, you're going to have to make do. But despite the treacherous journey, Bridget made it to the competition. This is the best part of it. <laughs> Samantha, hey, Samika Cash. Yeah, she's gonna be amazing. The day of show, I looked after all their paint, I looked after all their, their shine, and I made sure they were, the, the, their, their color and skin looked perfect, and it was. You gotta trust her, we've been married 28 years, right? So, he knows what he's doing. The lady's come to him. In a last-ditch effort to get water out of her body, Bridget eats salt before she goes on stage. But is that healthy? Is it healthy? No. Is it a temporary unhealthy thing to do? Yes, it is. Is it going to affect my health down the road? No. Bridget's months of hard work have been leading up to this moment. But will it be enough to impress the judges? Unfortunately, I had some setbacks, some major cramping that day, so I couldn't pose like I should. She was too conditioned. She was too hard. That is not what they were looking for. They were looking for a more softer, gentle physique. I wound up coming in seventh place, but hey, this is the pro league, so wherever you come in, just to get on the stage, you're doing it. For Bridget and Dean, competitions are about more than just flexing their muscles and are a chance to spend some quality time together as a family. Seeing my family compete on stage, it's really indescribable because I know what it's like to put all that effort and time uh, into stepping on stage. Whether you win or lose, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a success. My biggest achievement at this point is having my family compete with me. When you stand on stage with your whole family, there is nothing in the world that feels like that. And they're, they're carrying on your legacy, the same love you have for the sport. And with their first grandchild, Hunter, already initiated into the squad, could we see three generations of bodybuilders together on one stage? When I have kids, are they going to be bodybuilders? Yes, because they're genetics. Really good. <laughs>